Hey, everybody, it's Matt Dabbs here at discipleship.org with the podcast and the YouTube channel. And I'm here with Brandon Gindon, who is a wonderful person and a friend and has a lot of wisdom to share with us on disciple making culture. He's the founding pastor of the Real Life Ministries in Texas near Houston, author of a bunch of great books. I've read your books, I love them. I recommend them. I'm going to recommend them right now. We're going to link to them in the description. But that's the whole theme of the forum is on disciple making culture. And Brandon's work has been pretty foundational to a lot of the thinking on that. So uh, welcome, Brandon. Hey, well, uh, thank you so much. It's great to be with you, Matt. And, and I appreciate just all the work that you do and setting this up. So thank you. Oh, man, you're very, very welcome. What's well, a pleasure. So let's define our terms a bit, because we know that's always a good starting place. We can be using words and not mean the same thing. So when you talk about culture slash disciple making culture what do you what do you mean when you're using those words well you know culture is something that's beyond you know a program or a curriculum or culture comes out of who we are the 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 environment if you will the 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 values and of what we live out culture is is something that's naturally occurs out of you know the health of the leadership and and the the values of the leadership it's what we live out and one of the statements we make is is culture is all about who you are much more than just the things that you do and so when i'm talking about disciple making culture it is that that those definable characteristics those and those values that are being lived out that that create that culture that that environment that you live in you live in it and sometimes it kind of do you feel like it goes kind of goes undetected or it's just so normal that we don't it's like the 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 old story of the two fish crossing paths in the water and one says how's the water and the other one says what's water it's like you're in it like you know for for sure it it's you know the one of the simple old statements that I've heard and I, we make all the time is is culture is the way you do things. It's it's the way. It's who we are, and it's right. Once you're in it, it's really hard to to see it. It's that water. I think that's a really really good analogy. And one of the questions I've asked people before is, you know, if you were to follow Jesus around, if you were there with him, walking with him, how would you describe the culture that he created? And, you know, in the book and things that I've tried to do is really try to emulate that is, is what was that culture? How would you have described it? And, and so, yeah, it's the way you do things. Okay. So when we think about that and we think about it, there's, so there's kind of a, an undercurrent or there's kind of like a, there's, there's an environment that, that comes from somewhere and is taking people somewhere too. Right. So you kind of like have a culture that you've come out of. And then maybe you were a pastor who grew up in a certain kind of church, and now you find yourself in, you know, this new church or church that you're pastoring, and you kind of bring all that with you, but maybe you see some new ways of doing things. So there's sometimes some shifts in the way that we see culture or the way we experience it or what we want. But it seems like we always kind of get drawn back to what we know, like what's deep down inside. It's kind of hard to That's break right. free from that, but bring about some change. That's right. And I think what you're describing is that, I mean, that's so much of the tension is because culture is created uh, from the leadership. It's from those, you know, one of the things my friend Jim Putman says is, you know, as the he says this all the time, as the head goes, the body follows. I mean, that's an mm -hmm. old statement, but that's true. The culture that is created by those kind of at the top leadership, the senior pastor, maybe the staff and eldership or who at that group, and especially the point leader, it comes from who you are. And so in order to change culture, you have to really work at if there's unhealthy things you've created, or like you're saying, you've brought some things in from an old way or, or something from the church, that's all you ever knew. There takes some a bit of kind of maybe even some deprogramming, some real hard looks in the mirror, you know, and 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 I think culture is something that we always want to try and keep an eye on, like and notice are there unhealthy things? I mean, I've I've had to do that here in our church plant, even after even though we're only seven seven years in, that I've noticed some some things that are unhealthy. That my goodness, I need to change in my leadership, or I need to evaluate and make sure that doesn't become part of our culture. And so. Yes, it's the way that we do things and and looking at it to make sure the culture's healthy. Yeah. 
in psychology, there's a term called the, the meta, like metacognition. So you metacognition is thinking about how we think. Hmm. So like if I'm in an online conversation and someone's making uh, a proposition, like they're, they're, they're making a point. It's like, okay, that's a point, but let's think about how we got to that point. Like, let's think about what's going on when we say the things that we say or when we do the things that we do. And when I hear that word culture, it's kind of like, let's get under the surface of like, what's driving that? Where is it coming from? What value systems may be either explicit, we're saying them, promoting them or implicit. We never really thought about it, but that's really what's driving. Yeah. Point. Yeah. My uh, my men's pastor, one of the things that he says, he he came from the secular world. He was a high school football coach. And uh, he makes a statement. He says, the way you do anything is the way you do everything. Mm. And so if you're, if you're, you know, however that you do and live your life and and walk church out, walk your, your life as a disciple out is going to have that impact on, it, it's going to have the impact wherever that you go. And so, the way that you do anything is the way you do everything kind of thing. And I think that's, yeah. that's, that's true. Yeah. That's really good. Well, your book, you laid out these four key components of disciple making culture. And I think clearly you start in the right place, which is like the, the biblical foundation. Can you talk to us a little bit about that key point one key component? Yes. I think for all of us, we need to start in that place and go, we're not going to build it on I don't I don't think we should first look to well what's the current church doing today or what's kind of cultural or what I, I think that's the a wrong an incorrect starting place. I think the starting place is to ask that question I said a moment ago is what was the culture around Jesus? How how would we describe that when we read the 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 gospels? What was the culture in the in the early church in the book of Acts? What do we see and, and what were the characteristics? And we could describe those things. And to build the culture, build our own lives off of what that looks like. I mean, if I'm a follower of Jesus, I should be becoming more like Jesus, and therefore the culture that I that I create should become more and more like Jesus. Well, that's built off of a biblical foundation. It's not something you and I create. It's not something that's it's our brilliant ideas. It's what do we find in the scriptures, and. I think that must be our starting point. That's why in, in in the second chapter, I remember Bobby Harrington and I had a long discussion about this before I wrote the book, the issue of love. The whole second chapter is intentionally in the book on love because that is the key defining characteristic, biblical characteristic that should be in any culture. And, and you know, we break that down in there, but the biblical foundation of a disciple-making culture if you don't have love, the the whole thing falls apart. Like, and and anyway, and so I think that's where we start is this idea that any disciple making culture that we're going to be a part of must be built with a biblical foundation, which starts with that question to me of well, what did it look like following Jesus? What did the early church do? And then and then trying to imitate that, as Paul would say. That's really good. So. If we look at scripture, so like you just mentioned the word love, like if I can kind of just kind of take a riff off of that for a minute or so, it's like, okay, I think 1 Corinthians 13, right? And when I think about 1 Corinthians 13, even recently I've had conversations with people who have said they're kind of cessationists, like the Holy Spirit doesn't do much anymore kind of perspective. And they get down to all these gifts are going to pass away. And it's like, okay, so we're not going to do that stuff they used to do is kind of the point that's being made. And he's like, when the perfect comes and then they say, well, the perfect is the Bible, right? And we, once we have the Bible, we don't need all the other stuff anymore is the point that there's certain crowds that make this point. And so then I kind of, then I said, okay, well, let, let's look at the context. Let's look at authorial intent. When Paul said that, what did he mean? Who was he talking to? What was he saying? What was going on? And so you, you back up off of that. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, okay, chapter 12, he says, some of you are speaking in tongues. Some of you have this gift and that gift, and you're you're dividing over it because you're Greeks, mm -hmm. right? You're in Corinth, you're in Greece, and you have this, this culture of who has the, the better philosophy and who has the better gift. And so division's happening. Love is the solution. And then you back up off the division of 12 and the, and the tongues and all that into 11, and he's talking about the Lord's Supper. And people get into this house church the, the anti-house church argumentation from 1 Corinthians 11, because Paul says, don't you have homes to eat and drink in? 
And then they say, see, you shouldn't have church in a home because Paul condemned what they were doing and said, you know, worships like this, but go home and do the other stuff at home. They, they must not have been doing it at home. It's like, well, no, no. Okay. Hold on. Like, let's look at the culture. Right. Weren't that a culture? And the Greco-Roman culture was that I'm preaching here, but you know, the Greco-Roman culture was that the rich eat first, the rich eat in the prominent seats at the table, the poor and the slaves eat last. And so their, their communion was in the context of a meal somehow. We don't entirely know how that worked, but they are eating and drinking, getting drunk, the rich people, while the poor people have nothing left. That's exactly what he says in 1 Corinthians 11. If, if, but once you understand their culture is my point, the Bible has a culture. Like the gospel is written into a culture and is submersed in its own first century Judeo second temple like you could get into all the all the minutia on all of that but it's a little bit important to understand a little bit of that you know in order to translate that into what it looks like today and so paul's point is don't divide at the lord's supper so we're not dividing over who gets more food or what and the meal and all that but we might be dividing at communion in a different way as an american and so we might pay attention to who gets to serve that or did you put someone in a prominent position because you wanted their influence or you know things like this that so our culture comes to bear and so you have that bible culture you need to understand what's going on in their world in order to translate that into what's going on in our world and how might we it may not look exactly the same and how the problems bubble up because we're americans not greeks 2000 years later but the same principles still apply mm -hmm. right don't mm -hmm. divide at the table you know, mm -hmm. don't judge each other over who has which gifts. The mm -hmm. answer is still love, right? So I love that you're starting. I'm I'm going way too long here, but I love that you're starting with with love is the key to the whole thing. If we try to have a biblical foundation of stuff and strip the love out, man, you're starting on the right note. Well, yes, I I think and and love, you know, of course, I think it needs to be said, love doesn't necessarily mean you know what our cultures turned it into means acceptance and agreement sometimes love yeah. means saying really hard things to people yeah in fact if you were to stack up you know loving statements of jesus i would be curious of the percentage of those that were hard confrontational statements that were statements in love mm -hmm. uh, it, it, there's a there's quite a few of them and so when we talk about when i talk about love and part of that being part of the culture is we could go to First Corinthians thirteen and how all of that's defined, but but to your point, I, I think one of the things that you were describing of what happens in the church and the church today, the term that kept coming to my mind is compartmentalizing this whole thing, like the home church and the this and the that, and and I and what I always want to do when I start hearing church leaders do that is to go time out. You're already going down the wrong road. The road that you need to be in when we're talking about culture is not, okay, did they have services in their homes or was it only the time you're compartmentalizing? If we were to go back into the early church, I think out of what, what, when Paul says, imitate us as we have imitated Christ, there was a lifestyle when he goes into, into chapter two of Thessalonians, he says, not only did we share the gospel with you. The truth of the God. We shared our very lives. We yeah. lived together. We did life together. And you go into Acts 2. They were doing life together. They met in their homes. They met. I, we get into this place of trying to put it into neat little boxes. And I and I think, again, we don't know. But I think if you were to go back and ask them, they would look at us and go, what are you doing? This is a lifestyle that we live that is a sacrificial lifestyle following King Jesus. Don't, why are you, why are, and I think this is what the heart of what Paul is saying. Why are you fighting over this stuff? Like, no, th this is, this is a lifestyle that you live. And that's why if you go read in Romans, Romans eight around, the, I'm sorry, Romans 13. And he says that the continuing debt have no other debt, but the continuing debt to love one another. And he's he's saying the only debt that we can't really pay is every single day you and I wake up, we're in debt to each other because of what Christ has done. I I need to live out the debt that I have with the Lord for what he's done for me by loving you. That's how I pay that debt back. Mm -hmm. And he goes on and he says, he says, 
that whatever other he lists command, don't murder, do not steal, and whatever other commandment there might be, is to love to love your neighbor as yourself. And and I look at that and go, well, what about the commandment of do not take the Lord's name in vain? How is that summed up in loving my neighbor? Well, it's when you understand the context. Paul's saying he's not talking about swearing. He's talking about what it, to take the Lord's name in vain means don't take upon the name of the Lord like like a wife would take on the last name of a husband. Don't take upon the name of belonging to the Lord if you're going to mistreat your brother. I think in our context, it's say don't be wearing the Jesus jersey if you're going to drag it through the mud. Don't say you belong to Jesus if you're going to treat your neighbor like trash. Like the principle of love in the context of disciple making is the starting place. And and to treat it that way, and to and to be creating that kind of culture, because it's there, then we can, then we can start building something that's healthy and looks resembles the culture that Jesus created. Yeah, I, I love that. So what I hear you saying is, in a sense, like you can't compartmentalize a culture of love, right? So if it, it's it's super hypocritical to go, I'm going to come to church and be loving in that space, but it not pervade every other aspect of my life, or that the relationships in the church don't somehow pervade every other aspect of my life. All that's going on in there has to also come out here, right? So that the whole thing is consistent, because that's what Jesus showed us. He didn't compartmentalize the disciple walk to a day a week, or a certain room, or something like that. Like, it just pervades everything, because it's, it's identity, it's who you are. That's right. Yes. That's really good. So so biblical foundation, go back to the scriptures. And I hear you also, I believe you were saying something like, well, let's not just take it for granted that the way we've always done it is necessarily the perfect way to go about it, right? Because we know from that study, 4% of churches are disciple-making churches, but yet Jesus told the churches to make disciples. Well, and so there's already a little misalignment there, right? And so let, let's look at it fresh and say, like, what does that look like to have that biblical foundation? Right. And and I would just say, I mean, if I was to, I mean, even just the, the most recent uh, conference that I went to, you know, that we were, the, our network was, had one of the breakout sessions. And and this is consistent every single time is I have this this conversation. I'll talk on this topic. I come off the stage. And there will be several pastors or leaders, elders, various different positions in the church will come up to me and they will make this statement. Brandon, I, I, I totally believe in what you're saying, but I've never been discipled and I don't know how to make a disciple. Not the way that you're saying. It's like, well, I know how to teach a Sunday school class. I know how to preach a sermon. Uh, I know how to write a curriculum. I know how, whatever, fill in the blank, but they will say, I mean, it's just over and over and over. I, I'm not kidding. In 20 plus years of doing this, I've had that conversation. I'll bet you a thousand times. And, and it's back to that point. I go, when people are trying to repackage, put new wrapping paper on an old box. Mm -hmm. And, and mm -hmm. if we can find the, the, the snazzy enough wrapping paper, then we're good. And I'm saying we got to take the, that's what your point, the 4%, we got to chuck the box and, and step back and go, okay, let's build this from the ground up. What did Jesus do? What was the culture he created? What did the first century church do? And I get there's some different things. They wore different clothes and drove, didn't drive cars. And there, there's, I get it, the busyness and all of those things. But at, at the core of what the church is supposed to be is to build a the Great Commission off of the foundation that Jesus modeled and called us to. So. No, that's really, you no, know, I think that's exactly spot on. That, 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 so, it, but e even that goes back to love. Okay. So when somebody says, I want to make disciples, I've never been discipled. I don't know how to disciple someone. It's like, how, uh, if, if you love people, or if you love, you know, non-Christians, the the lost, the world, however you want to frame that, like how 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 much do you need to love them to figure that out? Like you're you're an elder in the church, you're 60 years old, and I'm not just blasting people. It's like I had so I had my own gut check on this a number of years ago, and I and I realized I I know how to make a convert, 
I know how to study and try to convince you. I can show you all the scriptures and say, well, you think this, but the Bible says that. And, you know, you're supposed to do X, Y, and Z. Great. That's all in the Bible. It's wonderful. But I don't know how to make a disciple like that would like mature and grow. Like no one ever showed me that. And so what did I do? It's like, and I'm not saying I've got the perfect solution, but I'm like, I, I literally just asked God to help me mm -hmm. when it hit me. When that hit me, I'm like, I've been in ministry for over 10, 15 years, whatever it was at the time. I don't know how to do it. I'm like, God, please show me how to do it. It's that important. Like whatever you, whatever you want to do. And it's a long story, but God showed me how to do it because I wanted to learn. I'm like, I'm open. Show me the way and I will do it. I promise you. And I, and I promised him, I said, I will do it the best of my ability for as long as possible. If you will show me how to do it. Amen. Mm -hmm. And I was at Pepperdine and at lectures and Bobby Harrington was in my class. And I was like, I think that's Bobby Harrington. I'd never met him before, but I kind of caught his face. I'm like, I don't know who that is. And he walked up to me after my class and said, do you know how to make disciples? I've been praying that for like four months, like regularly. And I'm like, no, but I've been praying somebody would show me how to do it. And he's like, I'll show you how to do it. That's awesome. Like, oh. And then I was like, wait a minute. I promised God I would really do it if he would show me. So now it's like ever since I've been doing it. And I'm not, okay, Matt, Matt's amazing or anything. What I'm saying is love. If you love someone, you're going to figure out how to communicate with them. If you love someone, you're going to figure out, like, what does that look like? Seek help, you know? Yes. Help is everywhere. Like, the information is every. I go to discipleship.org and go to the free resources. Go to your your book. Yeah. You know, go to Amazon. It's, yeah. it's everywhere. So. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah, and I think one thing that's you, what came into my mind, you brought up this point, is I just want anybody that's watching or listening to this, I, I, I would make want them to think about this. I think one of the things that happened in the church is we we changed we changed the focus and the celebration. If if Paul describes the journey as a race, the this life of a disciple, and we changed the the celebration, hmm. and the focus became once the gun goes off, bang, and they start the race. Woohoo! Everybody celebrated, and we've won. Like, like we moved the goal <clears throat> and the goal, that's not the goal. The goal is the finish line, right? And, and the life of discipling is walking. What we see Jesus do, and we see the early church do, we see Paul do with Timothy is walking with somebody in, in, in that journey of that race. And sometimes you're with somebody for an extended time. Sometimes it's shorter but discipleship is that lifestyle, that walk with them, doing life together, as Paul talked to the church at Thessalonica, walking that out. And all you're saying is, man, if I love somebody and, and I care about them, I'm going to learn how to do that. I'm going to learn of how that becomes my lifestyle because that's accomplishing the Great Commission. The Great Commission, and I mean, think of Jesus even with the 12, come follow me. Well, where are we going and what are we doing? Like, just come be with me. And they spent three years learning and watching. And and I don't know why we think we can do that any different than he did. Yeah. There's Master Plan of Evangelism. There's the free revisiting Master Plan of Evangelism PDF at discipleship.org. I mean, it's just simple stuff. Disciple Making Culture, Brandon Ginden. I hear that's a great read, you know. Uh, <laughs> read it. I love it. So this takes not only a biblical foundation, but key component, too, is that takes intentional leadership. Somebody has to say it. Somebody has to envision it. Somebody has to catch it and and take meaningful action. And that's one thing I appreciate about you, Brandon, is like God has given you a vision and you are executing on that. So, so much so that like your church is not just a gathering. It's a training ground. You have cohorts of disciple of church planters and disciple makers. And like you are living out and executing intentional leadership on what God has shown you from the scriptures. From your, so talk to us a little bit about intentional leadership, because a lot of people listening and watching are church leaders. Yeah, I think it starts with understanding the process of disciple making is not going to happen by accident. Left to ourselves, we kind of talked about this earlier, you're going to go back to old habits, you're going to, uh, you know, we just, I think naturally as people kind of choose paths of least resistance, Um and and I and I think when we look at the life of Jesus and the in the and the the book of Acts, disciple making required in, incredible intentionality. 
I mean, multiple times, Jesus, it says Jesus already had in mind what he was going to do. Jesus knew what he was going to do with that 12 and, 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 and the group of those that followed him, he was going to develop them into fishers of men. And so to tell leaders, people, disciple makers, this inquires great intentionality. It's not going to happen by accident. So you have to have a plan. You have to have the end in mind. You know, we started our residency here in our church for training church planners, and 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 now we're working with people all literally all over the world now through it. Is we created it because I, with the end in mind, I knew that as we make disciple makers and 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 what I would call spiritual parents that are that are effective disciple makers, we can't have a lid. Like, where do they go? Do they do they? You know, they become elders. They go into eldership. They come on staff. Well, I can only do so much at my my church. Well, where? How do I share this? How do I send these people out? How do I? And that was the whole genesis behind the residency. I had the end in mind. Jesus started with the end in mind. Paul started with the end in mind with Timothy. We have to start with the end in mind, and that that end is that that person or group of people or the people in our church become the greatest disciple makers they can be. That's what we're called to do. Nothing short of that. I joke with my church. I say, man, I want the Navy SEALs of disciple making. I want disciple making ninjas in my church, like great at it. And because that's what I'm, we're called to do. That doesn't, that's not going to happen by accident. And if we, and if you take that pr principle and apply it any other place in life, so developing a Navy SEAL, developing a, a great, like I, I use fly fishing to help my boys become great fly fishermen, all of the skills and techniques and things, it's not going to happen by handing them a book and saying, hey, go good luck. They may figure it out. It's going to be ugly. But if I stand next to them and I'm intentional with grip, I'm intentional with the motion, the eyes, the, the form, your arm, and model all of that for them they're going to learn it a lot faster and they're going to be a lot better at it. And so that's that principle to me about being in, intentional. And again, it comes from a lifestyle that we live and, and we have to constantly, constantly communicate um, uh, this process very intentionally with those we're discipling because Jesus did. And I keep going back to it. It's off the biblical foundation. Yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking when you were saying that. The, the two pieces of the intentional leadership has to be grounded in the biblical foundation. So ultimately, it seems to me that Jesus is the leader, like the ultimate leader, like you said, 1 Corinthians 11, 1, follow me as I, or imitate me as I imitate Christ. Mm -hmm. So although, yes, there are human leaders, certainly, and that's certainly biblical, you know, it's like Peter said, is it 1 Peter 5, maybe he's like the chief shepherd and overseer of our soul, almost like the chief elder is Jesus himself. So all elders are accountable to the chief elder, right? And Correct. so we're modeling after like taking his lead, following his lead, and then showing other people like, as I follow his lead, I want you to see how following his lead looks. I just keep pointing you to him. Sometimes churches get unhealthy, like point them to us, point them to the lead pastor and the personalities and all of that, you know, and disciple making culture is all about the, the Jesus culture, not the lead pastor culture, only to the degree that the lead pastor is is embodying embracing the Jesus culture, right? Correct. And that again, if I mean think of it this way, there there are there's religions, say say Mormonism is is very intentional in what they do. And even the other components are in talking about they're relational, they have a reproducible process, but it's not grounded in a biblical foundation. Right. So if we're not grounded in that biblical foundation, it's very easy for us to drift and intentionally make disciples of us. I don't want a disciple of me. And and we don't, that's that's short. That's not biblical. That's not what we want. And so you're right. The two things built the that intentional leadership builds off of the biblical foundation. Yes. So how are you as a church intentional in your leadership? Do you mean let me ask a question, make sure I hit it right. Do you mean intentional with like the corporate side with all of our small group leaders and disciple makers, or do you mean individually? What what do you mean? So I can answer that. So I mean, like if if we were to look at your church and go, okay, like what how is the leadership structured? Why is it the way it is? Like, how does disciple making or discipleship kind of infuse itself into your church leadership culture? Yeah. In so an intentional way. Yep. So starting from the top down, our eldership that I, I wouldn't, I will not have an elder 
in my eldership that's not a great disciple maker and leading a small group somewhere in our church. So before they're ever an elder, they're first a disciple maker and 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 continue to carry that. Then it, that also with my staff is if you're on my staff, you're going to lead a small group. You're going to be a great disciple maker. You you might even be coaching some small groups. Even my small groups pastor, I have three guys and, a, and one woman that all oversee big areas of small groups in our church. All of them individually lead their own small group. And so, so structure wise, we, we, you know, we have to live it out personally. And then, and then because the next component that we're going to get into is about a relational environment, the, the model in scripture, the Jethro principle is to break it down into smaller groups. We can't have healthy relational environments if we're just doing everything in mass or, you know, so even in an org chart, our, my org chart isn't Brandon Ginnon and a big flat org chart. It, I break everything down into smaller groups so that my staff even do life together in smaller in smaller groups, um, de- departments. But it's it's more than that. I just it's not just organizational. It's how they function. They do lunch. They do all, and and so we live it out intentionally, even in the organization. And then that just carries down through. We put our our small groups are clustered in small in in mid sized groups. We disciple people in small group environments. And so I'm just constantly breaking it down to make sure we're holding the integrity of relationship and culture. And so it starts at the top and and then all the way through the organization. Right. Well, so if somebody wants to find out more about what you're doing with all that, where can they find that? They could go to our website at reallifetexas.org, or I would encourage somebody if that's something you really want to do for your church, there's trainings that we do as part of the RDN network, a, a Disciple Shift One training. I would really encourage churches to look at that. That's what we teach and help people do is to make that shift. But also if it's an individual that's like, I I really want to learn personally and grow personally on my staff or or in planting a church, then I would reach out and, and to our residency and see about being a part of that. And that's through our through our website at reallifetexas.org our re, slash residency. Okay. And they can do that from distance or that has to be local? They can do it from distance. We have we just finished a cohort of nine. Six of the nine were from three other states. And so it, it's it's I'm really proud of the program. It's really working well. Okay. What well, we're gonna talk about the next two components in the follow-up interview to this relational environments and reproducibility. But are there any any last thoughts for us as we kind of wrap up this session? I'm, I just, you know, I love to give just a word of encouragement that if somebody's that sit, if, if you're sitting there and you're feeling like overwhelmed, or I'm not sure where to start or what to do, you know, I would encourage you to reach out, you know, to some of those things. There's so many different resources that are out there and just pick, pick a simple step to take. And maybe it is reading the Disciple Making Culture book. Maybe it's going to one of the conferences. Maybe it's checking out the resources at discipleship.org. But start taking a step. And, and you know, uh, it, it may look like you starting your first group or getting a group of people together and go, hey, let's figure this out together. But that it's possible. And, and I just want to encourage people that they can do this and start taking those steps. Yeah, that's so good. Well, thank you, Brandon. Look forward to the follow-up conversation. If you're watching part one, look out for part two. And appreciate you very much. Thank you, Matt. All right.